Now, this message today is designed to add to and to strengthen what should be the most significant understanding of your faith and thus be an encouragement to you. This understanding that we will discuss today is the anchor that holds our very life in place. It is the foundational underpinning of the Christian faith, the foundation that our life is built upon. It is the monumental truth of God's sovereignty. And as a result, understanding God's sovereignty is meant to impact us. It's meant to impact us like nothing else you could ever be taught in your life. So we ask ourselves today, how am I currently being influenced by the topic, the understanding, the theological truth of God's sovereignty? Is this something that I think about? Is this something that influences my thinking, influences my life, influences my love for God? See, in a world of such uncertainty, where sin is prevalent and the future is seemingly unstable and uncertain, the Christian must have at the core of his heart the only truth that can triumph over it all. And that is that the Lord God Almighty is in complete control, that the Lord God Almighty is all-powerful, and that the Lord God Almighty loves his people. Elaborating a little bit on what the sovereignty of God is, theologian A.W. Pink describes it this way. He says, the sovereignty of God may be defined as the exercise of his supremacy being infinitely elevated above the highest creature. He, God, the most high, Lord of heaven and earth, subject to none, influenced by none, absolutely independent. God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases. None can thwart him, none can hinder him. That is the sovereignty of God. That is a truth that us as Christians will be studying and learning and growing in our entire lives, but it is designed to have a massive impact on how we live. This truth that God is, this truth is more than just a simple line item on God's attributes. It's the very thing that holds together all the rest of biblical understanding. And it is meant to be what strengthens us. It's meant to be what invigorates us, gives us life, gives us courage, gives us strength. It's what's meant to allow the Christian to stand firm, to stand at peace, to stand content in the midst of any situation. And our psalm today is going to help us build our confidence in the Lord, and he's going to do it in three parts. We're going to see our psalm broken up in three parts. Yahweh's present rule, Yahweh's power over threats, and Yahweh's providing word. Now, Psalm 93 is a psalm just like the rest. It is designed to be sung. It's a song. Psalms are song writ songs written in bu beautiful poetry, imagery that is designed to teach us and designed to be celebrated. So let's do that today with our heart. They are poetic truth. And Psalm 93 is a part of actually a unique clustering of psalms, psalms known as enthronement psalms. And these include Psalm 47, 93, and then 95 through 99. Now, enthronement uh, songs are dedicated to celebrating God's divine sovereignty. That's their topic. And we see this in our psalm right from the very beginning, right from the very first verse. Verse 1, Yahweh reigns. Yahweh reigns. And this begins our first point, Yahweh's present rule. Yahweh's present rule. See, Yahweh's reign is a declaration. The psalmist is declaring Yahweh reigns. It's not asking. It's not suggesting. He is declaring emphatically, Yahweh, God of the Bible, reigns. And this is a joyous celebration this is a joyous celebration of the most important fact that any of us could learn, that God Almighty, he reigns. And while many translations might, might have, and as you might see in yours, the Lord, the Lord reigns, 
We know that when we see the Lord in all caps, what is being translated is God's covenant name given to Moses in Exodus 3. It is Yahweh. And that is God's covenant name when he gives his covenant to his people. So when you see Yahweh, you see God describing himself with his name as the God who has made covenant relationship to save. That's the God who reigns, the God who saves, and the God who has made commitment to save. That's an amazing truth. He reigns, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that God. He reigns. And you'll notice it's an active verb. In the original language in the Hebrew, this is an active perfect tense verb. What does that mean? It means right now, God is actively reigning. Right now, moment by moment, in real time, God reigns. And he continues to reign. It's a reign that is continuous. It doesn't have an end. Now, one who reigns has direct oversight of, and as a result of, authority of what he reigns over. And the psalmist is celebrating this. The Old Testament Jews sang this. Keep in mind as we build this psalm out that this is a song that people sang with joy. And add that to your heart's song. And in a time where kings ruled, where kings reigned over nations and nations war, warred against each other, the Jewish people celebrated the true reality as we should that only Yahweh truly is reigning. So the question is this, is this the song of your heart? Is all of what I just described, just in this first nine minutes, is this something that is a part of your thinking, your thong, your song? Is this a part of the energy that you take with you throughout the day as someone who professes Christ? The joy that our God reigns. That's our question. Do we celebrate this? In the midst of political uncertainty, we are so eager to ask, who is going to be in charge of our country next? This person is going to determine so much, and it's true. But the Christian truly understands that no matter who is in control, no matter who is in charge down here, the reality is God is in control. Yahweh reigns. And it's amazing, the psalmist begins to elaborate on this picture. We could have ended the sermon there, Yahweh reigns. And we could walk out of here celebrating together, Yahweh reigns. The best news, but he continues on. He, he gives this visual, and it's amazing. He says, he is clothed with majesty. Yahweh has clothed and girded himself with strength. Majesty. Love this word, majesty. Not something we use often, but we understand majesty is a significant word. Now, majesty, in essence, is excellence, to the highest order, excellence to the highest order. This is where we get terms such as your majesty and your excellency, things that we might say, you see how I kind of have to say with a bridge, your excellency, your majesty, right? Said to a king, we understand what we're saying. Saying to a human king, we understand what we're saying, what we're doing is we're placing them above others in quality and in value. Your excellency, you are the top. Your majesty, there is none above you. We are placing you above. Now, the difference here is obviously we are not, gonna, not talking about human kings. And the other difference is, is that the excellency, the worth and the value of Yahweh is not given to him. It's not something that Yahweh puts on as something external or foreign to him. He doesn't wake up in his PJs like a regular man needing to put on his royal robe and needing to assume his royal position. No, he is that inherently. It would be impossible to separate God from his majesty, his infinite value and his infinite worth above all things. It is inherently what he is. He is the highest concept of both excellence and value. They are who he is at his being. And he is these things infinitely. Infinitely. God is infinite. We hear this term, God is infinite. He never ends, which means all of his attributes never end, which means his majesty, his excellence, those things never end. What does that even mean? There is an end to me. I only go so far. It's not very far. 
But God goes infinitely. His value above all things, and it's infinite. It never ends. That's an amazing thought. And in fact, the Lord's majesty is a gift to the believer. So only true believers can begin to see who God truly is and begin to sort of grasp this concept of God's majesty. Isaiah 26, 10 reads this. It says, though the wicked is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly in the land of uprightness and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord. You see, without true saving faith, One might acknowledge God. Plenty of people acknowledge that perhaps a God exists, but only in Christ can one see the majesty of God and begin to understand the significance of who God is and then further understand the significance of the phrase Yahweh reigns. Yahweh reigns begins to have significant impact on your life when you understand who Yahweh is. No mere man, no small God, Nothing created out of the imagination of man. He is the almighty, infinite, infinite value creator. So the question is, do you think on God's majesty? Do you see him for who he truly is? Is God's majesty, his, his grandioseness, his, his, his being above all things and then infinitely something that you think about when you pray to him? How massive he is, how significant he is. Are these things that are meshed into your thinking? They should be because that's who he is. Continuing on, it says, Yahweh has clothed and girded himself in strength. Indeed, the world is established. It will not be shaken. Now, the Lord could claim rain, and he could be inherently majestic, but it is his strength that enables him to function as sovereign God. It's interesting, right? Rain, majesty, all-encompassing majesticness, strength. His strength is what allows him to function as sovereign God. So his strength is something that must be understood by the believer. And we see here this cool imagery of God. It says he's girding, girding. This is an image of God tying. Girding is tying, right, is tying. Back in ancient times, there there was a lot of cloaks wearing. And in the New Testament time, even the Roman soldiers would wear a cloak. It was a very easy item to wear. But what they would do is they would gird their waist. They would gird their loins. What it means is it brings everything together nice and tight. It keeps it together. Roman soldiers were known for girding it all together and having their weapons safely secured by what girds them. So what we're seeing is this beautiful imagery of God saying, this is who I am. I reign. I'm majestic. And I am girded with strength. Now, strength is obviously God's power. And that's how the world is established. It is established with God's power, and it will not be shaken, as it says, because through God's power, the world comes into existence, and through God's power, the world is preserved. You see, our security in God is directly tied to his power. Because remember, we are building the fact that God reigns and the fact that that is supposed to have significant impact on our lives. Well, a powerful God is something that is designed to give us strength, give us confidence, right? It's like a little child who's with dad. Nothing can, can sway this little child from having fun when they're near dad. When dad is around, take a peek, dad's there, I'm good. Off they go in their own little worlds, the freedom of a child. Imagine us. And imagine God, our heavenly father, all powerful, going through life. Where's God? God, he's right here. I'm good. I'm good. My dad is here, all powerful, majestic God. Not only is he here, he reigns, controls all this. What a bragging friend. My dad, my dad's bigger than your dad. My dad controls everything, everything. That's amazing. Talk about confidence. That's how it should impact us. So understanding God's power is an important concept. Our security in God is tied to that. 
We think of Hebrews 1, chapter 3, it says this, He, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of his hands, power of his, of his word, excuse me. Now here, Jesus Christ is being affirmed as equal to the Father, as his exact imprint. And at the same time, Jesus Christ, God himself, being acknowledged for his power as he upholds and he sustains every molecule in the universe. God's power is so significant that it proves his existence and it demands recognition. Romans 1.20 says this, for his God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived or clearly seen ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Creation and the physical is the physical expression of God's power. When you look around and you see the world around you, it shouldn't be a, a neutral thing, kind of an indifferent thing that we become sort of just it normalized. No, we understand that this very planet, the ecosystem that we live in, the universe is an expression of Yahweh's power. Yahweh who reigns. It's incredible. Verse two of our text expands more on his reign. It says this, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Now God reigns. God's reign was not a succession and he wasn't next in line and he received it when it was his time, right? We are not Mormons who believe that you and me and the rest of us will one day become gods. That is a false lie. God is not simply living out his term. He is not simply in an order then to pass it along to his own prodigy. Isaiah 44, 6 says this, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, quote, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Yahweh's reign is eternal because Yahweh is eternal. Exodus 15, 18 reminds us the same, says the Lord will reign forever and ever continually adding to the significance of Yahweh's reign. It's eternal. It will never end. Us, we end. We will be history just like the many, many millions of people that have existed. Think back in history. Billions of people, 8 billion currently. Think about history. Thousands of years. Billions of people have existed, had lives, had families, are gone. They're just a memory. Yet who still remains on his throne? Yahweh, he reigns. And if the, law, if the Lord tarries and another thousand years comes and another eight billion people show up, someone will stand in the pulpit and proclaim from Psalm 93, Yahweh reigns and it'll be worth celebrating then just the same as it is worth celebrating now. And it should affect their lives. We would look into the future and say, allow this truth to affect your life. Now the question is to you, are we living every day with these images in our mind? Just painted a huge picture of God, just in two verses, how, how monumental the Psalms are. If the Psalms are not a normal part of your devotions, I highly recommend inserting the Psalms. This imagery is designed to make God vivid in your brain, that when you're praying, you see this, and when you're struggling, you see this, and it will impact you, you will see. Are we proclaiming this the moment difficulty comes into, our, into our, our, our life? Are these the things that impact our confidence? Because every detail God gives about himself that he has given to us himself is meant to impact your life. This is why the Bible can be such a significant tool because it is designed to change you. It's not stories, not fairy tales, not just good information. 
It is truth designed to affect your life. And as believers, if we are truly living for Christ in a way that Christ deserves from us, in a way that shows the significance of what Christ has done for us, we will be eager to dive into the word, to apply it to our lives, because that's how we show him we love him. If we claim to be Christians saved by the blood of Christ, our life should be the equivalent to that through gratitude. All right, you can give me a, a birthday gift and maybe I'll give you a thank you card. Hey, thanks so much, appreciate you. That would be the equivalent. Jesus Christ gave us the greatest gift that could ever be given, ever. Salvation in Jesus Christ. <laughs> saving us from damnation in hell for eternity. Because guess what? We all deserve that. Every single one deserves that, including myself, in this moment. But through Christ Jesus, we have been pardoned from that. We get the free gift of salvation. Okay, well, what's my thank you letter look like? Thank you, Jesus? No. It's the greatest thing that I can give, which is my life. That's what we give to Christ, and that's why we give it, because he deserves it. That's where the Bible becomes so special to us. Give me the book. If it's going to show me how to show love to my king, I want to do that. We are building upon this idea that who God is, that he reigns, is designed to impact our lives. And our security in God is definitely and should definitely be impacted by the fact that he presently reigns all of that in action right now. Our next point adds to this, point number two, Yahweh's power over threats. Yahweh's power over threats. Verse three, it says, the rivers have lifted up, O Yahweh. The rivers had lifted up their voice. The rivers lift up their pounding waves. Now, there are two ways that scholars interpret this. The first is literally, in that the psalmist is asking, what about these mighty waters? What about water? The oceans, massive bodies of water that extend as far as the eye can see. They have so much power, and we know that. They can cause immense damage and immense death, and they are untamable by man. The best we can do is maybe redirect it. We have need to be sheltered from the rain, navigate through the rain or through the waters. And the question is, Lord, are these under your jurisdiction? Does that mighty thing qualify for your sovereignty? Well, I think our first point answers these questions for us. God's reign via his infinite power is what established creation. And we know God created the waters in Genesis 1, and not only that, but he owns the waters. Every single drop of water is owned and controlled by Yahweh, our God. Jeremiah 31, 35 shows us, it says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the seas so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. He stirs them up. He's in complete control. It's nothing. God controls every element of his creation. And we are reminded of this in the wonderful story of Jesus in the boat with his disciples, are we not? The scene captured so famously in the Rembrandt painting where the roaring sea of Galilee and his disciples fearing for their lives, holding on to the ropes, scared out of their mind. And what was Jesus doing? Sleeping, sleeping in the bottom of the boat. His response, why are you afraid? In, in essence saying, do you not realize I reign? What about us? How often are we so afraid of the things that God controls? How often are we so afraid of the, of the world around us that God controls? If you are afraid of the world that God controls, it says something about how you think about God. 
Jesus says, why are you afraid, you little faith? And he rose up, he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a calm. Still. Their response? The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What kind of man? Well, we know, not any ordinary type of man. God himself, Yahweh who reigns in human flesh. The account in Mark says this, it says, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Because our Lord and Savior, God in human flesh, is in control of all things. And that level of power is not something we're familiar with. It's not something we see every day. It's not something that we understand. So when it is seen, it demands a fearful respect. It, rem- it demands a respect and amazement. They understood in that moment that they were standing before God himself. That would blow your mind. But here we are as New Testament Christians with the same understanding. Might not be in the boat. Jesus might not be here, but we understand that Jesus is God and God is everywhere. Everywhere. God's power is meant to affect you inside your heart, give you a sense of confidence. The other way of viewing this section is the raging rebellion of sinful man. And you might be thinking, well, how do you get to this conclusion from water and rivers and sea and that imagery? Well, believe it or not, the language is not uncommon in the Bible. Let me show you. Isaiah 17, 12 through 13 says this, Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like chaff in the mountains before the wind or like the whirling dust before a gale. So here rebellious man is being seen with the same violent imagery that we can see with water, rages, hits the side, boom, splashes up and can be loud against the boat, boom. Rebellious man has this imagery. And all through the ages, we understand that this has been true. From the very beginning, man has shaken his fist at God. He lifts his voice in opposition, curses God, denies God, alters God to fit what they would like. Sometimes it even seems that this world is only continuing to get worse. Secularism only seems to be becoming more and more accepted and praised and demanded. God is seemingly being pushed further and further away from everything. This is the world we live in. Loud crashes of the waves of unregenerate sinners creating a disaster. That's the world we live in. Reminds us of Roman one, Romans 1, where it says, Though they knew God's righteous dec- uh, decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. They encourage each other with such loud voices to rebel against God. They encourage each other to take the absurdity and let it become normal, main street, stream. What would have been so extreme just 10 years ago is normalized today. What about 10 years? And what about 10 years after that? The raging waters of sinful man will always continue to yell and scream and shake their fist. The question is, what about this, God? What about this madness that has always existed? Are you in control of this? Well, the next verse in our and point number two is the response. You can almost hear this in terms of the, the thought of this being a song, the Old Testament Jews singing in response, oftentimes in Jewish songs, singing and then response, uh, proclamation and then affirmation, things like that. What about the roaring nations they sing? Does Yahweh control these things, they ask? Verse four, more than the voices of many waters, than the mighty breakers of the sea, Yahweh on high is mighty. Charles Spurgeon sums up this response by saying this, quote, sometimes men are furious in words. 
They lift up their voice. And other times they rise to acts of violence. They lift up their waves, but the Lord has control over them in either case. The ungodly are all foam and fury, noise and bluster during their little hour. And then the tide turns or the storm is hushed and we hear no more of them while the kingdom of the eternal abides in the grandeur of its power forever. There's nothing you can imagine in this world, in your mind, or what you may have seen, or what we read in history. There is nothing. And there is nothing that you could face in your life. No issue, no difficulty, no surprise. People come and go. Relationships come and go. There is nothing that Yahweh is not, as our verse says, more than, more than. So start getting in the habit in life when you meet certain things to say, Yahweh, my God, the Lord, Father in heaven, you are more than this. More than this. What an understatement. More than this. And then in your mind, bring Psalm 93 and let it explode with all of the imagery we just saw. and Watch how that affects your life. We need to understand that even the depravity of man The sinfulness of man is under the control of God. Romans 1, which describes in further detail the depravity of man, reminds us that, verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts and in purity. And verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And this, of course, leads to and has led all across history to sinful nations waging war against each other and producing what we see before our very eyes, a sinful world. But Psalm 9, 6 through 8 reminds us, it says, the enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities, you rooted them out. The very memory of them has perished but the Lord sits in throne forever. He has established his throne for justice and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. Think about the mighty nations that have come and gone, mighty nations that conquered the world, mighty nations that even conquered the land of Israel, separating its people, putting them into exile, the mighty nation of of America, It's all the part of history that God is in control of. It says, cities you rooted out, not difficultly. You ever pull out like a weed, a small one, comes right out, see the the root, it's gone. That's God in his reigning. That's God. That is your father in heaven. That is his reign. Isaiah 40, 22 says, it is he who sits above the circles of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. 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 God is saying it's nothing. Significant to us down here when we're faced with these things. But that's why we have a psalm like Psalm 93, to encourage us and to embolden us and to strengthen us to go through life, to take on challenges that the Lord is bringing into our life anyway. And what is the Lord doing when he gives you challenges, difficulties, trials, tests in your life? What is he doing? He's doing one thing, always the same, by the way. Many people say, oh, this one's hard. I don't know what the Lord's doing. What are you doing, Lord? This one's too hard. Take take me out of this. What are you doing? He is always, always, always doing the exact same thing. He is conforming you into the image of your Savior. Sanctification is the fancy theological word. He's sanctifying you. He is maturing you. He's giving you opportunity to exercise your faith. Exercise makes you strong. Your muscles can't grow unless you lift heavy weights. Same with your faith. Your faith will not grow unless the Lord gives you a opportunity to lift Psalm 93 and put it on your situation. Because guess what? Over time, it becomes lighter. And before you know it, you throw it down with with, with confidence and strength. My God, reigns. Nothing you can do. There should be nothing in this world that sways us from peace and contentment. Why? God reigns. You either believe that or you don't. And we should. We have all the reason in the world to believe that our God reigns. 
Our final point in building this confidence in God is founded in Yahweh's providing word. Yahweh's providing word. Verse 5, it says, Your testimonies are very faithful. Holiness befits your house, O Yahweh, forevermore. God's testimonies are his word. God says, what God says are his testimonies. They are his guidance to us. It is his guidebook to his creation. And they are meant to bring us security. And they're meant to be something that is extremely valuable to us. The psalmist says they are faithful. God's words, what God says, his testimonies, what his sayings, they're faithful. So just like his reign over creation is fixed and immovable and unstoppable, so too his truth is fixed. It's fixed. It's always true. They are faithful to mean what they say always. God's word is faithful to produce what they say they will produce always. God's word is faithful that they will always be reliable. Always. He's faithful. This means they are faithful to always provide exactly what the Lord intended them to provide for you and for me. That's very encouraging. It's very strengthening. With God's reign comes God's decrees, right? Every new king that comes into a nation has new decrees. He changes things. Every new president that we have comes in and creates new executive orders because that's what he has the ability to do. Yet we understand Yahweh reigns. Yahweh has already given decrees. They will never change. They will be faithful forever. And we can bank our entire lives on them. And that's what, in fact, we do. Unlike the changing disposition of earthly men, God's worth is faithful and true for eternity. Isaiah 48, 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Matthew 24, 35, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but the words of God will not pass away. Now, why is this so important to us? Why is it important for us to understand that God's words are faithful, trustworthy, will never change, and will never go away? Because like I mentioned, our very lives are dependent upon God's word being true. If God's word were, were, were not true, what confidence can we have in salvation? What confidence that we can have that God is going to do what he says he's going to do in terms of salvation? It's dependent upon God's faithfulness because salvation is dependent upon what? Understanding God's word. When Jesus first starts his ministry in the account of Mark, the shortest of it, it says simply this. First words, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. I am here, Savior, here, now, listen. Repent and believe the gospel, period. It's the first thing Jesus said in terms of articulating what salvation is. Repent, believe the gospel. Well, what you believe is what's important. What you believe, that information that fits within that context, what is the gospel? Better get that right. Well, where's the book? Here it is. Well, is that true? I hope so, because I'm banking my whole life on that. And I can, because it comes from the source. It comes from God himself. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and the hearing through the word of Christ. Well, in order for this to be true, the word I am hearing must also be true and it must be faithful. It must not change, it must be consistent. We're banking on that. But the psalmist gives an even deeper level of confidence in God's word. Here's this. He says, holiness befits your house. Holiness. Another word for befits is adorns. Holiness adorns your house. Right? Love the language of the Psalms. God is holy. And as holy, he cannot lie and can only be truthful. Otherwise, he wouldn't be holy. His holiness is meant to give us confidence. His holiness ensures that what I see around me through his confident control is completely just. What is happening within the bounds of his holiness require that what I'm seeing in life is just. 
I don't question it. Why? Because God who is in control is holy. I trust that. I refuse to allow my mind to say, well, I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't seem fair. You don't want fair. I don't want fair. What's fair is that we get fairly what we deserve right now in this moment. You know what that would be for you and I to get what's fair? Exactly what we deserve. Forget fair from your perspective. Take God's perspective of holiness and God's offering of salvation and be confident that it is in fact the way to salvation. It will never change. God did not lie because he cannot. He is holy. He is trustworthy. You can stand on that. You can bank your salvation on that. Now, what I need to do is trust that God is holy. Now, his house is he's adorned with holiness. Well, what does this mean? It's simply an expression to show that when you were to, if you were to walk into God's house, his house would be decorated with every little knickknack of holiness that you can buy at Hobby Lobby. His house would just be immersed in it because that's who he is. Your home represents who you are, doesn't it? So this imagery is giving you an understanding that the Lord's house is covered head to toe wallpaper holiness. It's beautiful. It's designed to give you imagery. Who's God? God, the invisible God, holy. These are invisible, amazing thoughts. Yet how amazing is our God to give us these things? Why did God give us these psalms, these poetic things? They're so difficult. They're not. They're beautiful. Because in my mind, I see the Lord, his throne engulfed in holiness with holy wallpaper and things. That's my thinking. That's not the case, but that's my thinking to understand it's immense. It's beautiful. The Lord comes down to our, our level, gives us imagery that we can understand. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 says this, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. God's holiness becomes our standard. Your standard for life, my standard for life, God's holiness. What? Because God's holiness is infinite. We can never, ever, ever, ever achieve, even close to achieve God's holiness, which is why we will never, ever, ever be able to earn our salvation, ever. There's nothing we could ever do to ever impress God's holiness, ever. But nonetheless, it's our standard. Nonetheless, that's our goal. So since we lack holiness and his holiness ensures his word is trustworthy, we must see his word for how infinitely valuable that is. Because when in times of need or times of trouble, which we all face, we should be eager to do what? Turn to his word. We should be eager to hear the words that he has given us to sustain us. We should be eager to find the guidance for the situation that we're in trusting that they are perfect, trusting that they are true, trusting that they will lead me to holiness, and I want that. Why? Because I love my Father. I love Him. I love Him. I want to honor Him. I want to serve Him. I want to be a good son, not to impress Him, not to earn anything, simply out of my love and my gratitude. And there's only one way I can do that, through His Word. And how can I trust that that is the way He actually wants? Because it came from him and his holiness. They are perfect and true. And just knowing they exist, just knowing the Bible exists is meant to give us confidence through our difficulties. Confidence that my God has provided me with all that I need to know in order to serve him faithfully. But not only confidence in trouble, confidence that it is the way that I show love and devotion to the Lord. And not only that, but understanding, and this is where Psalm 119 shines so brightly. Spend some time in Psalm 119, my goodness. David's love for the word of God is meant to show us how we are supposed to feel towards it. You're indifferent about the Bible? There's a problem. There's a big problem. Because Yahweh reigns. 
and Yahweh is all-powerful, and Yahweh holds salvation in his hands, and if this is something that you have received from him, salvation, it's not an indifferent thing. That's why it's called being born again. Your life changes. It is significant. It is seen. There is a love there for this Savior because part of the salvation package is an understanding of what we deserve. I know what I deserve. And every day I sin, I'm reminded of what I deserve, but I'm also reminded of what I've been given in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Every time I sin, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry, Lord, for saying sorry again for the same thing. But at the same time, immediately say, but thank you. Thank you for the gift of salvation. That gratitude is designed to drive us through life, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, the greatest commandment. How am I ever going to obey and satisfy that greatest commandment? That's why it's so valuable. That's why David loved it so much because it led him to what he needed to know for him to live for his great God. That should be all of our desires. And we'll walk out here and just live for the Lord the way he wants. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about anybody else. Everybody's just a vapor. I'm not letting vapor, dust in the wind affect how I live for my king. No, we need to be stronger than that. Psalm 119, it says this, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek them with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Oh, Lord, is that your, is that your plea in your prayers? Oh, Lord, that I be faithful to you. Oh, Lord, that my steps would be steadfast. Oh, Lord, that I'd be faithful to you through difficulties. Oh, Lord, that I would simply be strong and stand firm, stand tall and proud through the midst of difficulty. I will not let it sway me from my love and obedience to you. So here's the question. Do you desire God's words in these days, in this way? Do you have what Peter describes when he says, like newborn infants, Long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up in salvation. I want to grow up in salvation. I absolutely want to, and so should you. That should be your main goal every day. Lord, strengthen me, mature me, make me into the image of my Savior. Why? Because that's when I give him glory with my life, and I want that. He deserves that. Save my sorry, but he deserves that. Absolutely, he deserves that. If you don't think so, you misunderstand what salvation is. Perhaps you don't see the true value. Perhaps you have not received the true gift. Because when you have, you receive it, and your understanding changes. The value is infinitely valuable. It changes everything. It will naturally change your life. It says he's storing it up. Let's store it up like David says, knowing that our great God is a God that wants us to know him deeper. He wants us to love him deeper. Nobody's arrived. We all have work to do. We all could love our Lord more. We all can know him more, absolutely. And he deserves that effort, doesn't he? Does he not? That's what the word is for. That's why it's so valuable. Let us be those people today. So I pray that Psalm 93 becomes this vivid image in your mind that Yahweh reigns. Who's Yahweh? My father. Yours, if you are a true follower of Christ. And that is designed to impact your life. Let it walk around with strength. Why are you so confident? Go read Psalm 93, you'll know. Why, 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 why are you not fearing in this moment? Uh, the church is in, a, is in a unique situation. Why are we not fearing? Because Yahweh reigns. What is there to fear? Yahweh is in control. This is Yahweh's time. He brings who he brings. He takes who he takes. And he sustains his people. And he's been faithfully doing that forever. Yahweh reigns. Let's let that affect our lives today. Amen, church? All right, let's pray. Gracious King, Yahweh our God, we are so thankful. Thankful primarily, Lord, for you showing your love to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. As you came down, God Almighty, on your throne, comfortable in heaven, you came down and enrobed yourself in human flesh and allowed your very creation to kill you on the cross. But Father, we know that that was your plan all along to provide a payment for what we owed Father, we know that God died because we owed death. We understand that you paid what we owed. So, Father, thank you. 
Let that reality shake us to the core. Let that reality cause us to live in a gratitude that drives us to you every day, that gives us a boldness to stand firm for who we are as men and women of Jesus Christ. Let that influence how we act, how we speak, how we live, and let that draw us to your word as as the source of how we can please you and continue to know you. And if there are people here that do not know you in that way, Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes that they would begin to have the itch to understand that they are a sinner like the rest of us and that you, a holy God, reign. And not only do you reign, you will judge sin and that we all must get right with you. We all must come bowing before you and reconcile with you through the only way that you provide, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And that happens through believing him, believing on him as that payment believing on him as God himself satisfying your wrath and only Jesus Christ. And then that shows up in a life of repentance, repentance of a life turning away from a life without Christ, without you, without thought of you, without devotion to you, and then turning towards a life devoted to you, Yahweh our God. Do this work in your people, Father. Bless this church. Strengthen them, Lord. Give them a hope to know that you reign. And their job is simply to be faithful in this moment, in this time in history. What a privilege it is to be faithful to you in this time. Bless them, Lord. Bring them what they need. Sustain them along the way. Let them grow closer to each other as a family, understanding that salvation is not a lone wolf type thing. We are saved into the body of Christ. We are collectively your bride. Let us relish that, Father, and serve each other well. Use the gifts that you've given to each other to bless each other, knowing that that gives you glory. Father, let us remember in the word that you gave us, our Savior, on his face, washing feet, on his face, looking down. And let us think of when he looks up and says, go and do likewise. Father, let us be motivated to serve each other like our Savior came to serve. Let us be those people, Father. Let us bring you glory with our lives and do be glorified. We pray to you, of course, always in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.